two, one. Check, 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 check. Check. Check, check, check. Good evening. I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. And I want to welcome you all. Um, as I think you probably have figured out and been saying to each other, there's something a little screwy about tonight. And the thing that has happened is that the weather has played us a couple of, uh, of tricks, but not terrible ones. Um, you may have read about the storm system that's coming up the East Coast. 
that caught EJ uh, in Washington. He was on his way here early in the afternoon and his plane uh, eventually uh, had to be, it was canceled and we diverted him to Manchester, uh, New Hampshire. He has landed in Manchester. He is on his way here and uh, will be here, we hope, uh, in time to deliver his lecture tonight. Uh, we also, you may have noticed, uh, we have another few significant absences in these seats on the front row that are usually save for Walter Shorenstein and friends of Walter Shorenstein who intended to be here with us as well. They have gotten caught in the same nasty weather pattern. We don't know for sure whether they are going to be able to make it or not. But um, I'm very glad you are here. We are extremely glad that Molly Ivins is here. A bit later, as I say, we hope <clears throat> you're going to hear from E.J. Dion, our distinguished white lecturer for 2006. But first, I have another task to perform, which is an honor, uh, but a bittersweet one. Two years ago, <clears throat> we at the Shorenstein Center lost a great and much admired friend, David Nine, who died unexpectedly after he came inside to take a break from shoveling snow. Many of you knew David well. Some of you did not uh, want, in, but some of you did not. And I want to speak to him as we, this year, bestow the second annual David Nyan Prize for political journalism. David Nyan was a man of many parts, devoted family man, beloved friend, always boon companion. He was a big, handsome man with a killer smile, Irish eyes, the rare power to light up a room just by walking into it. I've seen him do it again and again while he was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. But tonight we honor David Nyan, the consummate reporter and political journalist, which was the role that occupied much of his life and at which he could not be bested. David was a reporter and then a columnist at the Boston Globe, and his work had both a theme and a character. The theme was almost always power, especially political power, and also especially the abuse of political power by the big shots at the expense of the little guys. He loved politics, and he also loved politicians. As a group, he respected them, felt that they were often themselves given a raw deal and judged by a standard that was smug and sanctimonious, two things David Nyan never was. For David, politics was the way things got done or the reason things didn't get done. He was a reporter's reporter when it came to rooting out the what really happened aspect of a political story and especially loved being able to debunk the popular wisdom. He was an aficionado of hypocrisy and cant and at the same time was the first person to defend a beleaguered politician whose crime was that he was human rather than that he was corrupt. But if politics was the theme of David's work, the character of that work was a mixture of courage and righteous anger, leavened by a great sense of humor and the ability to write like a dream. He relished a good, meaning a bad, fight with a political figure or perspective. He had a knack of seeing beyond the surface of issues and the baloney to the heart of things, and especially to the reality of what was going on. I would love to hear what David would have to say about the big dig right now. <laughs> he was a self-avowed liberal and utterly not defensive about it. As a columnist at the Globe, he was a battler and no holds barred advocate, but he always also was surprising his readers with his take on things because most of all, David Nyan was his own man. In his memory and honor, the Nyan family and many friends and admirers of David Nyan have endowed the David Nyan Prize for political journalism to recognize the kind of gutsy, stylish, and relentless journalism that embodied David Nyan. His wife, Olivia, and many members of his family are here tonight, and I would like to ask them to stand. Please.
This year, the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism goes to Molly Ivins. Molly had departed the New York Times after a tumultuous six-year run when I arrived there in 1983. But in the newsroom, she was a legend. The story went that what her got her canned was that she referred to a community chicken killing festival as a gang pluck. <laughs> Abe Rosenthal was the editor of the Times, and though he was a great newsman, he'd been the editor of the Times, he'd insisted on publishing the Pentagon Papers, he wasn't known for an irreverent sense of humor. The way I heard the story, and Molly has confirmed that it's so, he screamed at Molly, he, upon occasion, screamed at everyone, practically, certainly including me. Anyway, he screamed at Molly, you won't stick your thumb in the eye of the New York Times ever again. It may be that Molly didn't get to stick her thumb in the Times' eye again in quite so robust a way, but she's made a career of eye-thumbing and made it into an art form at which she is matchless. Last month, a group of friends gathered in Austin, Texas, to celebrate her career, especially the part of it connected with the Texas Observer, the feisty newspaper where she was once editor. The gathering included a large helping of Mollyisms, as they are called. For instance, if his IQ were any lower, they'd have to water him twice a day. <laughs> and there were also a selection of things that she had on what she called her own overrated list which included Mack trucks, the FBI, and some other things that she can get away with saying, but that I cannot. She can complete that list tonight if she chooses. She, like David Nyan, whom the Nyan Prize honors, is very funny, partly for its own sake, but even more often to make a devastating point that is used to puncture hypocrisy, lambaste stupidity, shame greed, or put a thumb squarely in the eye of someone she regards as needing it. Molly graduated from Smith College, got a master's degree in journalism at Columbia, and then studied for a year in Paris. She describes her first newspaper job as that of sewer editor of the Houston Chronicle, which the paper thought was a sort of nuts and bolts city beat. She went from there to the Minneapolis Tribune as the, women, as first, the city's first woman police reporter, after that, her job, as she describes it, was doing stories on militant blacks, angry Indians, radical students, uppity women, and a motley assortment of other misfits and troublemakers, which sounds just her cup of tea. Then it was back to Texas and the Texas Observer, to the New York Times, to be the hair shirt of Abe Rosenthal, and following the gang pluck episode, back to Texas for good. Her syndicated column, which appears in more than 300 papers nationwide, is based at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. In all that time, she has repeatedly spoken fierce truth to power and undermined her targets by skewering them with humor that even they often found funny. One of her best books is one known with the title Shrub, which is about a junior bush. She has recently been fighting cancer, but it has not stopped her, either from using her column to afflict the powerful, nor, I'm glad to say, from coming to Cambridge to accept the Nyan Prize for political journalism. As you might expect, the recent election had her in high dudgeon and great form. In her column on election eve, she wrote, this campaign has been like getting stuck in Alice's Wonderland for three months. There's no use trying, Alice said, quoting Alice in Wonderland, one can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't much practice, replied the white queen. When I was your age, I always did it half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Molly continued, every time you turn around, you run into the jabberwocky of the frumious bandersnatch, Richard Pearl in penitence, or some other equally fantastic sight. The great sky rider in the sky has positively run amuck with irony and has been splashing it all over the campaign like Jackson Pollock. Fortunately, it is not my duty to lend dignity to the proceedings. I do make it a rule 
the skip talk of sex, drug, drugs, and rock and roll. But when Mark Foley turns out to be the chairman of the House Committee on Missing and Exploited Children, you know you have to sit down like a tired dog and scratch for a while. It is my honor to present the Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to that eye-thumbing, scratching dog of a columnist, Molly Ivins. Molly does have some things to say, but as I said, she's not been well. Uh, she's feisty as ever, but she will deliver her remarks seated. All right. Um, you, I'll stand up for this part? Yeah. You want to stand up or sit down? Um, I'll stand up for this part because I just want to... Um, Let me get this out here. I want to begin by saying what an extraordinary honor it is to receive a prize named after Dave Nyan. I mean, it really doesn't get better than that. Uh, if you're a professional journalist, to receive an award named after somebody who was just a fantastic triple hitter, um, great deadline reporter, um, watched him do it time after time. Um, you know, he's just handing in those sheets one after another as right as they were being dictated. It was really extraordinary. Um, not only a great deadline reporter, a great columnist, and finally, I think more important than anything else, the kind of journalist who puts things in a framework um, so that um, it's not just one thing after another flashing by you, um, who, what, why, where, when, and how, uh, and on to the next one. Um, this was a man who studied our time and our people, and um, it's just an extraordinary gift this afternoon. I really cannot tell you how moved I am by this. Um, I'm at a stage in my career where I'm starting to get a lot of Lifetime Achievement Awards. <clears throat> and word, word has gotten out that I have cancer, and so um, they're really coming thick and fast, you know. And <laughs> lifetime Achievement for Southeastern Texas women journalists and all kinds of exciting stuff. Um, this is one that um, is so, it just means so much to me because Dave Diane was such a great guy. And I thank you, and now I'm going to sit down and talk. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about what's wrong with newspapers. And um, I have been in the newspaper business since 1964. Um, and during that entire time, I've been told that it's a dying industry. Well, I don't mind being part of a dying industry. It's an interesting dying interest industry, and it gives you lots of opportunities to laugh and learn. And it hardly ever gets better than that. Um, they actually pay you to go out and learn something new every day. What a deal. What a deal. Um, I don't mind being part of a dying industry. It really pisses me off to be part of one that's committing suicide, which is what we are watching newspapers across America do. And they are committing suicide um, because the people who own them are incredibly greedy. Um, the rate of return for a normal single ownership town for a newspaper is around 20%, which is higher than the oil business gets. 
Um, it has been um, discovered by those who watch such things that we are, in fact, losing both circulation and advertising. And so then the question arises, what to do? Losing circulation and advertising. Well, what you do if you are the kind of geniuses who write business plans for newspapers is um, you decide to make your product um, more boring, less useful, and uh, altogether of very little point. Um, it is really quite wonderful to watch people who supposedly know about money um, judge how to do these things. They decide that what we should do is we should get rid of the people who make the newspaper a decent newspaper, just start chopping them off little bit by little bit, um, and then uh, everything will be better. It is the silliest damn thing I've ever watched in my life. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, know a Florida writer named Carl Hyacin, uh, but he wrote a wonderful book about the newspaper business called uh, Basket Case, which is about the elimination of the job of an obituary writer on a small Florida newspaper. And I think it explains as well as anything I have ever come across why when you kill a newspaper, the community dies. Um, the, um, it also includes, to my absolute enchantment, I recommend it highly. Uh, I worked for 10 years for a man named Tony Ritter. I didn't like him any better than I liked Abe Rosenthal. <laughs> <laughs> There's a classically nasty portrait of Tony Ritter in this book. Um, and I say writers should take our shots where we can find them. Um, the trouble with as you as you look at the newspaper business responding in this craven and stupid fashion <clears throat> to what they perceive as a threat from the internet, um, I got to teach at Cal Berkeley about eight years ago. And I would say that about 85% of my students then expected to practice journalism on the internet. And I said, well, that's fine. We, we, of course you will. And it will be exactly the same problem. You will A, have to find out whether or not it's true, and you will B, have to put it into some package that is useful to people. Now, the big debate is about whether or not they have figured out if there is such a thing as a package that is useful to people. In other words, that provides all the information that a newspaper does um, and um, is also somehow gettable, addable. Um, and one of the complaints about the internet, of course, is that um, you can't even figure out a way to put the classified ads in order, uh, much less everything else that comes in a newspaper. I assume they will eventually get that. I mean, I have nothing against uh, new technology, but I do think it's silly for us to make the same mistake we've made before. Um, when uh, radio was first invented, it was predicted that newspapers would promptly croak. When television was first introduced, it was predicted that radio would croak. Uh, what has happened as each new technology of communication uh, comes online, on board, is that they seem to stack up side by side, uh, complementing one another in, in special ways, um, rather than you know, be stacked on top of one another and bury each other. Um, and I suspect that that is what is going to happen with the new technology as well. Um, what I don't understand is why the people who own newspapers, aside from the fact that, that um, they're now run by 24-year-olds who work for Wall Street and have never been on a newspaper in their lives, um, why they seem to think that it's necessary to panic. 
Um, they've actually figured out that circulation will decrease so that in the year 2027, there will be not one subscriber left. I think there probably will be. Probably be a really grumpy old guy up in Alaska saying, people are no damn good. <laughs> um, if the absurdity of the response of the newspaper business um, is, um, okay, that's a good laugh. Nyan would like it. Uh, but there is, and I'm going to go ahead and sound all kind of windy and pompous, um, there is an importance about newspapers. They serve a need in a community. We, our readers are not just consumers, they're citizens. And the conversation we have among ourselves as a democracy is really what this country is about. And you can't have that conversation without information. And we are definitely seeing information become um, more, well, I like to blame Rupert Murdoch. Um, who is, in fact, the first newspaper he bought in the United States was in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm afraid that it is a grid that has spread far and wide. Um, and newspapers tend to be uh, kind of like poker pots. When you're in a competitive newspaper situation, both of you can go high, go for, do a high-end effective journalism, both of you can go low, or you can split the pot, kind of like the Daily News and the New York Times in New York. Um, but it is interesting how easily the low-end journalism catches on. Um, within a year of Murdoch's arrival in San Antonio in the beginning of uh, really uh, uh, a sleazy form of journalism that we hadn't been accustomed to. I mean, we, we were accustomed to bad newspapers, but they were sort of bad in the sense of mediocre, flatulent, um, just kind of puddings, you know, apt to sit there and not do much. And um, within two years of, of Murdoch showing up with the <coughs> They had a certain number of words, stab, rape, um, kill, but they were, they were almost all four-letter words, and they had to be used in a huge front-page headline at least 10 times a month, or the editor was fired. And um, of course, they also discovered the delights of adding really, um, as we say in the Texas legislature, heart-rendering. Um, <laughs> photographs of uh, small children who'd been killed in automobile accidents in their little tiny tennis shoes being left by the side of the road. And it was really very affecting. And so the other papers in town took it up, and the newspaper, the uh, TV people took it up. Uh, this um, uh, emphasis on blood and gore. Um, and you could see the entire structure of the news of the community crumble into this kind of disgusting. Um, I remember one time they were really short of blood and gore. And so there was this huge red headline that said, who raped, then beat to death Mrs. Hertz in church? Well. It turned out, I don't know, and they didn't either, it was an unsolved crime from the 1930s. <laughs> and that began a really exciting series on great uncrime, unsolved crimes in the, in the history of San Antonio. And I do think that in many ways what we have seen, particularly with television, is an effect of Rupert Murdoch. Um, but I like to blame lots of other people, too. Um, obviously, the, um, we have reached a point that it's almost pure insanity with the Tribune's, uh, the story of the Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. 
Um, the <laughs> Los Angeles Times was really one of the most interesting papers in the country. Um, and it was doing something that I thought was particularly interesting because there's been all this blah, blah, blah about community journalism in our field. Um, which is that not only were they a great newspaper in the sense of covering foreign news, in the sense of covering national news, of having really, really fine journalists, um, but people thought it was silly at the time, and very, very LA, where by LA would they make you sign a memo saying that if you ever went out to write about, you know, growing tomatoes in backyards, you would have to include several different ethnic groups. You would have to include your backyard Mexican tomato growers, your backyard Vietnamese tomato growers, and so on. And um, at more than most places, um, the, um, Los Angeles is a mixed bag ethnically. I think it's over 50%. Uh, mm, majority minority as we have learned to say in Texas. Um, but the result was a newspaper that reflected the community in a way that you don't see in other places. And it, was, it became something that was not a special deal. Not that, and we're pointing out, please notice that the Vietnamese grow tomatoes too. Uh, but it just it, it took in everything. People got used to the idea that there were all different stripes of all different everythings around. And um, that was one reason I think it became such an interesting newspaper. And you knew after the LA Times won five Pulitzer Prizes and the Tribune Corporation, the parent company, did not put a single one of them on the front page of its corporate newsletter that they really didn't give a damn. And they really don't. And they have proved it again and again. And um, finally firing Dean Bacay, um on election eve. Well, what a brilliant move. Um, and I think, I think you see there the worst possible example of what happens when you let greed and Wall Street um, make all the decisions. And, and um, that is precisely what is happening to newspapers all over the country. Now, um, I'm, before I um, depress everybody horribly, um, I thought I would talk about newspapers as entities um, that have important cultural pools um, and that, that need to be kept intact. Um, one is, of course, um, that newspapers um, keep alive the tradition of collecting news, little gems from the police blotter. And in any small town newspaper, you will find the police blotter. And it's really full of interesting things. Well, actually, often not very interesting things. Dog heard barking at 6 AM. Um, but so there are some gems. And there are the news, newspaper people are the only people in the world who save them. Um, there was one not long ago from Mill Valley, California. Uh, perp arrested, charged with disturbing the peace for playing the ukulele while wearing a penguin costume. <laughs> now, this is the kind of thing that should not be let go. Um, and um, it just to prove to you that it is not, you know, some crazy out in Mill Valley. Um, we had one the other day, a small town in South Carolina. Um, the uh, perp was extremely drunk. And he had decided in his drunken state that it would be fun to screw a pumpkin. And so he did. <laughs> and um, 
the police came up to him and said, sir, are you aware that you're screwing a pumpkin? And he said, bam, is it midnight already? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh. Now, <laughs> new and more horrible. Um, the other thing that you find, of course, cherished on newspapers <laughs> is great leads. Great leads written but not printed, great leads written and printed. Um, I've always been terribly fond of one that uh, appeared in the Odessa America. It was a hot summer day in Odessa, which is definitely redundant. Um, and um, uh, some local mother rear-ended a sporting good van, and the back doors popped open and all the sporting goods equipment and tennis rackets and stuff was spilled all over the street. And for every reporter who's ever w written a weather story, uh, I know you will enjoy tennis, golf balls the size of hail rained on the streets of Odessa <laughs> Tuesday. Um, the most famous um, lead ever written and printed um, I believe is from Chicago, and you're going to have to help me, some of you here, with the, uh, it was the Leopold Loeb case, and these two students at the University of Chicago had edited, indulged in a thrill killing, and, uh, and they had not been sentenced to death, um, but they, uh, one was in the Huskow and the other had promptly died. And the one who was in the Huskow uh, was also gay, and he had um, approached a, a fellow prisoner who was not appreciative of his gesture and um, shanked him to death. And the lead was um, Robert Leopold, a graduate of the University of Chicago who should have known better, ended his sentence with a proposition to stay. <laughs> um, the one I like that was never printed anywhere, and this often happens in um, sex fearing stories that tend to follow a certain pattern. Um, sure enough, the uh, New Jersey State Police had uncovered a, a sex club, that, uh, a clubhouse that contained whips and boots and spurs and all kinds of interesting paraphernalia. And um, this was duly reported. And then, as often happens in these stories, the second day they found a small black book containing the names of those who frequented this interesting establishment. And sure as a by God, the names of many people who were prominent in New Jersey society and political circles uh, appeared in this book. So the second day lead, uh, which went out over the A-wire but never appeared anywhere, was the names of the whipped cream of New Jersey society <laughs> on Tuesday in a small black book. Uh, yes, we we'll do some. I'll be happy to uh, I want to invite uh, uh, those of you, we, we are expecting EJ to be arriving, but while I, I've got the uh, advantage of Molly Ivins. I can't resist uh, having a conversation with her a bit about what she does and how she does what she does. But I want to open the floor to your questions as well. There are microphones here, here, there, and up there. And if any of you have questions, just go to the mic and I will recognize you. I want to ask yeah. Molly, what, what of all the things you've written that have made people really pissed off, what has been the one that has pissed off someone the worst? There are certain subjects that are guaranteed to um, set people off. Uh, abortion, death penalty. Um, they run in a subject area. Um, and I, I have a collection called My Best Hate Mail. But I have to admit, my all-time favorite piece of mail is a fan letter, and it begins Dear Miss Simons, you are the favorite writer of all us guys here on Cell Block H. <laughs> <laughs> yes, up here, if you would identify yourself. Oh, hi, Molly. Um, Molly Ivins is the only person could, I could know. Could you identify yourself? Oh, my name is Marilyn Rakel. I'm a mid-career. 
and I have the pleasure of knowing Molly Ivins. And I would just like to say that of all the people I know, she is able to lambaste the rascals in our government and make us proud to be Americans in the process. But I'd like to ask you, you know the Texas politician. What do you think is going through George Bush's mind right now? What do I think of going through? No, what, what is going through George Bush's mind? Oh, yeah, well, now, I you know. You mean senior or junior? That would be junior. Um, I have known him for a long time, and I um, uh, have tried not over the years to give in to hatred of George Bush because um, the right wing makes so much de deal of us uh, disliking George Bush rather <laughs> in a rather affirmative action, fashion. Um, and I do remember how much how the people who hated Clinton with a livid passion just used to amaze me. I mean, just a good old boy. I mean, <laughs> what? Um, what is going through W's mind? Um, not much. <laughs> <laughs> George is just, he really thought this was going to be an easy deal. Um, and I think he's very upset about what's happened here. Um, I, I think he had very little understanding of what it meant to be president or what he needed to know to know, uh, needed to, know to be president. Um, in fact, there's a lot of evidence suggesting he had very little idea at all. Um, and I think that the, you know, George's way is to get over hard ground as quickly as possible. I think he's just, oh good, if Jim Baker is going to come in and help, then let them take it and do something with it. Because it's clearly not been looking good. Um, and I thought it was kind of sad that they decided to blame Rumsfeld for everything. He's the only one who was ever any fun. Um, you don't find Cheney fun? No, Cheney is not a fun guy, although I have to admit, I was sitting there one Sunday afternoon and the phone rang and a friend of mine said, Molly, you watching television? I said, no. He said, I think you should. Dick Cheney's just shot Harry Whittington. <laughs> and I said, you know, I think I can do something with that. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, I'm here. Hi, I'm David Escamé. I'm a student at the college, and I'm from Dallas, Texas, which actually well, voted... Which from where, Texas? Dallas. Dallas. Which actually voted Democrat in the last election. Is this part of a potentially larger trend in Texas politics? Um, well, no, I'm afraid it's just the urban areas. Um, if you look at the suburbs surrounding Dallas, you still get almost twice as many votes uh, as you get from the entire valley, uh, which is the brown section of Texas. So we're better off than we were just because the cities are turning black. That's true of Houston, too. Uh, but, um, you know, it's nice not to have all those horrible Republican judges around anymore. But, um, no, I don't think it's a long-term future thing. I, in fact, I think Texas has uh, jumped the shark, as they say. I think it has just gone off on a political toot that doesn't resemble anyone else's reality. And, um, of course, we have Governor Goodhair, the, the um, victor in this last election. Well, it was a hell of a, an exciting deal, let me tell you. I mean, you, you couldn't make up your mind. Um, there they were, all four candidates. And um, good hair has been governor for so long, nobody can remember when he wasn't. And um, he was up there with his hair looking good. And uh, Ms. Strayhorn, she talks about 30, 40 miles an hour with gusts up to 70. 
um, <laughs> kind of a terrifying experience. Then uh, Kinky uh, Friedman, uh, the Texas Jew boy, uh, Kinky kind of got overly invested in redneck humor toward the end of the campaign and offended a lot of people. Uh, which you would think it would be hard to do if you start out being Kinky Friedman with the intention of offending, offending a lot of people, but it turned out to be possible. And then this nice gray man named Chris Bell, um, and damned if we didn't reelect old good here. Now, let me explain that it's possible to make progress with Rick Perry as governor. Um, he needed uh, a new person, new person on the state utilities regulatory board two years ago, and uh, chose for this purpose a former Enron executive, which didn't strike everybody as a great idea, <laughs> uh, but it struck the governor as a great idea. And um, so he points this guy, and we don't have, in Texas, we don't have a sunshine law. We have kind of the partly cloudy law. <laughs> but even under Texas law, when you, if you get a major appointment like that, um, then you've got to fill out a bunch of forms saying your know, finances and background and all that kind of thing. Uh, so um, this Enron guy filled it out, and the part on the form where it says you should, you have to list your any unfortunate involvement with law enforcement authorities um, had been whited out. The answer had been whited out. Now this was a pretty clever cover up, but we in the press noticed it, and so <laughs> we went and found out that he had, while on a hunting trip a year earlier, accidentally shot a whooping crane, which is, as we say in Texas, an endangered species. He not only shot the whooping crane, he accidentally buried the whooping crane, <laughs> and he had to pay a huge fine. So um, we, we put this in... Uh, the papers, and Texas is a state full of hunters, and then they're all sitting there going, yeah, so bitch, you know, poor guy, he, he shot, accidentally shot a whooper, hell, anybody could accidentally shoot a whooper, and they didn't give a damn. But uh, we printed the next day, we stayed with the story, this is where, where uh, relentless pursuit will get the young reporter ahead. Um, he shot the whooper while on a duck hunt. Now, the whooper is a large bird. The whooper actually runs to about five feet tall. Your duck. <laughs> now we got a whole state full of hunters saying, well, God damn, this is some bitch too dumb to tell a duck from a whooper. <laughs> and he was forced to resign. And that's how we make progress. <laughs> Good evening, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, Ms. Hyman. I'm Wesley Oliver, and I'm a junior in the college. My question is, how have you been able to negotiate throughout your career the need for the reporter's objectivity with the columnist's need to get close to the subject and to offer analysis? How would I compare? How did, how did you, could you say that again? Yes, yeah. how would you sort of, how have you negotiated the reporter's need for some subject, for objectivity? Uh, and maintaining a distance from the subject with the columnists need to get close to the subject in, in order to provide analysis? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm always, and don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, the truth is that the reason um, I have a lot of great political horses is, uh, sources is because I like to drink with politicians. <laughs> um, and I'm a, I have been over the years a serious beer drinker, and um, I like, actually like, like Dave and I, and I actually like politicians. And um, as a result, um, I've just spent a lot of time hanging around with them. I did that when I was a police reporter, too. Um, I don't know whether it's the beer or the personality. Um, and I think 
in theory, I believe, along with the late, great I.S. Stone, that you must sit in your bathtub and want nothing from these people. You don't want to be um, invited to their dinner parties. You don't want to be invited to their backyard parties. You, you just want to you know, do the, do the reporting the way Izzy did. Go into the records and read it all. I mean, he really was just fantastic. Um, I mostly get my stories from people I know. And um, I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. That's just the way I do it. Um, Have you ever had to make a hard call between one of these politicians you really like personally, but you just felt that you it's, really didn't uh, come I mean, I'm sorry to say it's never been a hard call for me. I mean, I'm just, I was going to be perfectly happy to screw them. <laughs> um, I do have some real good friends, have had some good friends who were politicians, and one of them became governor of Texas. Um, and that unnerved me so much that um, during the entire four years Ann Richards was governor, I didn't ask her for anything. I didn't ask her for an interview or anything. I did ask her to speak once to a gifted and talented class from Dallas that was in town, but that was Were it. you ever tempted to write a column that would have unleashed that Molly Ivins humor on Ann Richards? Um, I'm not sure anybody should try unleashing their humor on, uh, on <laughs> Annie Richards. She's pretty funny herself. Um, No, and I'm, I am trying very hard to write about her objectively. I think about it now, and I'm, I tried way too hard, and I wasted a lot of good material. But it had never happened before, so what the hell? This way. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Kara Miller, and I'm a doctoral student at Tufts, and I'm also a columnist for the Metro West Daily News, which is in the Framingham area. And I just had a question for you about columnists. And I was wondering what you thought um, in, of kind of the state of columnists today. I mean, I read the New York Times columnists tend to be my favorite, Frank Rich and Maureen Dowd. And, and I know that when um, William Sapphire uh, retired, Maureen Dowd hoped that they would be able to find out of an right. entire country of women, maybe one more woman. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think they have nine columnists and one woman. Um, so I was wondering what you thought of that and, and just kind of the, yeah, the state of, you know, when you were talking about newspapers before and how interesting do you find columnists? Are newspapers coming up with interesting columnists? And then also, I was wondering about the impact of fame on columnists. I mean, I, I know like Larry Kudlow has a column, which I don't know if you've ever tried yeah. to read it, but it's not yeah. really very good. Um, and Neil Cavuto has a column and, you know, mm. people I think sometimes get famous first and then get columns later, and it's yeah. probably not as good as people who come up from through newspapers. Well, um, let me make sure that we, that I'm answering her question. Um, I think, try the first one about mm -hmm. Maureen Dowd's comment that, about women columnists in particular. Are there women columnists out there that don't get the, the oh, attention? Yeah that they should, oh, yeah. because they're not being... Oh, every time I read one of those articles, I sit there going, what am I, chopped liver? What's Ellen? Come on. Um, and I'm, I, I don't think she said there were none. She just said that the... But that it's consistently underrated and, un, mm. and unmentioned because we don't have outlets in either New York or Washington. And you still have a mm. media concentration in both those places that influences national coverage. And unless you have an outlet in one of those two cities, um, you, they've almost never heard of you, no matter how many newspapers you're in. Is the web something that would change that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, do you do online stuff very much? No. Have you thought about blogging? No. I got enough to do. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, how do you go yeah. about writing your column? I mean, how do you, in the, just as a, in terms of a craft, how do you go about it? I mean, the Dick Cheney one was a gift, I guess, but they're not all gifts. You gotta, yeah. you know, you gotta find them, and you also. Well, it's it's um, you know the old rule is you you read seven or eight newspapers every day, and plus the internet and. Um, if you find anything that makes you laugh out loud or makes you absolutely furious, you've got a column. If you don't find any such thing, you are in deep trouble. Deep trouble. And um, then you fall back on the files, you know, great column ideas, truly great column ideas, really wonderful column ideas, and they're all horrible. Um, and so, um, I do, it's almost a relief to me now, I haven't tackled an issue in so long because we've been in a political season. I, and I can't wait to do um, some health insurance, medical health insurance, because there are a lot of ideas for how to solve that problem, uh, but none of them include um, turning it over to the insurance companies, which they have come up with as the really perfect solution for all of this. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I love to just take after and, mm. and uh, drill them. And you talked about your stack of hate mail. I think that a lot of people outside journalism don't realize that perhaps next to politicians, journalists probably get more hate mail than, than anyone. Yeah. Uh, I save my better ones, too. Yeah. So have you been getting hate mail from the very beginning, or is that something that's come from your syndicated column? I mean, is that, did you just automatically act as a hate mail magnet from the start? <laughs> no, actually, I don't think that I ever thought that I was being particularly unkind or unfair. Um, but I was writing for the Texas Observer oh, when I first started doing opinion. And um, that will um, that 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 will get you an audience of people who agree with you. Um, although observer readers can be very picky, they're like New York Times readers. Um, there's um, is anything happening we should know about here? I don't know. I mean, okay. I see that Walter Shorenstein has finally arrived here. Oh, right. and, uh, I feel like I feel like these are all orphans from the storm, and uh, who are who are kind of uh, trying to beat the elements. Do we know uh, what the status of things is with EJ? Nancy, five minutes. Great. Um, Molly. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My name's Anjanette Damon. I'm a mid-career student here. And I was wondering if you have any advice. What should young journalists do to stop the industry from committing suicide? Well, the, OK, that's the question that I've, I've sort of been waiting for. I mean, you know, the young journalist who says forlornly, is it even worth tr continuing? Is it even worth trying? Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. In the first place, it's a really great way to make a living. They pay you to have fun and do good. And you hardly ever get that combination anywhere else. Get paid to have fun and do good. And um, I think that one of the things you should never forget about journalism is that when you have done good, when you have nailed some skunk's hide to the wall, you should sit there and gloat over it a great deal. Um, that's a big part of the fun. And I, yeah, I was listening to those, those Washington journalists who say, well, yes, I know I caused him to resign, but I really feel very bad about it. Oh, shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and look, we are going to need to invent some substitute for newspapers. Now, I don't, think that news, I don't think that the internet can do it. I just don't think that as a medium, um, it is organizable or warm and cuddly enough. Um, because the whole point is communicating. 
Um, and uh, we were talking about um, new columnists. I'm not sure we have any <clears throat> as good as those we've lost recently. Mike Royko was a columnist who defined an entire city full of people. They all know about the mayor, they all do what the mayor's doing, they oh, well, Royko says the mayor's doing this. Um, Jimmy Breslin in New York um, defined the entire attitude of the working class of that city, uh, mostly by reflecting it really well. Um, David, here in Boston, um, I liked what um, Teddy Kennedy said after David died, that there's nothing better to start the day than a cup of coffee in a Dave Nyan column, even if it, some indigestion comes with it. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to think of a new way to make community. And I think that, you know, that fancy word that sociologists use um, um, for lack of connected lists or rootlessness. Um, I think that it becomes more and more of a problem in this society. And I swear to you, if you put out a newspaper, and all it said on its front was, guaranteed one good laugh a day, you would have a successful newspaper. Now, I was, uh, for many years, the um, daily chuckle editor. <laughs> the daily chuckle editor? <laughs> daily chuckle editor of the Minneapolis Tribune. And the rules were that you could not mention race, sex, politics, booze, or religion, the only five funny subjects on earth. <laughs> and um, that's when I learned how important laughter is to people. If you just say to them, you know, and here's a whole section of the paper and it's about sports, that's a really a serious thing. Well, sometimes, but. <laughs> um, the um, I, I just uh, we're, we're going to have to invent it or reinvent it. We're often reinventing things at the newspapers. Remember the peach sections? Were you around in the early '60s when we all had peach sure. sections? Mm -hmm. They're back. I think everything is going to be back. I don't know quite. <laughs> but do you? Let me ask you. Yeah. You you have made part of your trademark injecting humor mm -hmm. into your columns. Now, how much satisfaction do you get and do you know when you've really found something funny? Does it just come off the page? Do you recognize it immediately? Are you wrong sometimes? What do you think? Well, yeah, I am. And then the, um, Russell Baker uh, wrote a really interesting and important essay once about how easy it is to hurt people by being funny uh, and how careful you have to be um, because you really can wound people. I mean, I mean, basically, we're talking about civilians. We're not talking to anybody in print or politics. But I mean, I know that, that politicians have mothers and wives who love them, but that's not my fault. <laughs> they didn't, I mean, no one, no one held a gun to their heads and made them run for office. Do you have a favorite Mollyism or some? Oh, gosh, um, great observations um, on politicians I have known. Good heavens. Read it to us. Well, what it says here is, EJ is arrived. Yay! Well, EJ. You're welcome. Very glad to have you here. Um, Oh, I've been brilliant substituting for you. We're going to reconstitute the, uh, the stage a little bit, but before we do that, I want you to please join me in a round of applause for this gallant great lady who's sitting here, Molly Allen.
get that thing? You can just take, you can just, why don't you just take it with you? And, you can, and, and Molly, this is. Oh, lovely. Is, yeah. okay. lovely. Why don't you sit right there? Well, we have two gallant people here tonight. E.J., please, come have a seat. Uh, E.J. started this marathon journey, I don't know what time, about noon? Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, first of all, how much I appreciate, all of us appreciate, your fighting it all the way through. We're really glad you're here. Theodore White was another consummate reporter whose passion was politics. He came to Harvard as a newsboy or on a newsboy scholarship, went to a very distinguished, onto a very distinguished career as a journalist and also a historian. Indeed, Teddy White, as he was universally known, changed both political journalism and politics when he wrote The Making of a President in 1960 about the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. For the first time, he raised the curtain on the sausage-making side of presidential campaigns and changed forever the candor and behind-the-scenes drama that is now at the heart of campaign coverage. He followed that first book with three more, Making of a President books in 1964, 1968, 1972. No one has yet matched those smart and groundbreaking examinations of what happens and why in the maelstrom of a political campaign. And it is fair to say that Teddy Kennedy or Teddy White's heirs are the journalists of today who try to pierce the veil of politics, to understand what is happening, and then to analyze and deliver the goods to those of us who are trying to understand. Before his death in 1986, Teddy White was one of the architects of what became the Shorenstein Center. One of the first moves Marvin Kalb, the center's founding director, did was to establish the Theodore H. White Lecture on the Press politi and Politics in his honor. This year, the White Lecture is to be delivered by E.J. Dion, one of the nation's best and most influential political commentators, and very much in the tradition of Teddy White. We have some of Teddy White's family here tonight, and I would invite you, please, to stand and be recognized. I personally came to know E.J. when we were colleagues at the New York Times, and he was the wonderkin of political journalism, writing shrewd and lively stories and generally shaming the opposition, especially the Washington Post. He had also done absolutely stellar work covering the Vatican, as Catholicism is another of his consuming interests. As the Vatican bureau chief, his work drew raves and was described in the Los Angeles Times as the best in two decades. A lot of us at the New York Times thought that E.J. was to the paper what Johnny Damon was to the Red Sox, a crown jewel. This being the big leagues of journalism, the Washington Post swept in and stole E.J. away, which not only stripped our team of an MVP, but gave a staggering edge to our blood rivals in Washington. The move has been good for political reporting, though, and good for democratic governance, because the Post gave EJ the opportunity to become a nationally syndicated columnist and to allow his passionate but solidly grounded political analysis allowed it to find an audience beyond the times. EJ Dion Jr., Eugene Jerome, actually. Joseph, Joseph I beg your pardon. I was told Jerome by someone who no, thought she knew. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> was born in Boston, raised in Fall River, and went to Harvard, where he was Phi Beta Kappa. He was a Rhodes Scholar and has a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford. 
His family background is French Canadian. As a matter of fact, his sister tells me that, that English is actually EJ's second language. He grew up, not grew up, but he was first introduced uh, to life as a French speaking child. And those who know his columns know that his Catholic roots of strong family values show strongly through his work, all of it, though he is a strong political liberal. One of the things that's often underlooked in the highly overlooked in the highly partisan bickering of recent years is that there's a powerful liberal tradition in Catholicism, what might be called Dorothy Day Catholicism, after the crusading but devout Catholic who championed progressive causes in the 1930s in the Catholic worker. The power of this deeply value-based political perspective is enormous and often quite moving as it's expressed in EJ's writing and commentary. For instance, in a column last month, he was scorching in his anger, which is rather unusual, at the way liberals tend to sneer at the concept of family values for politically expedient advantage. In particular, he was outraged at the principal reaction among liberal Democrats to the embarrassing Tom Foley scandal was so shallow. Foley, you will recall, had been accused of effectively hitting on young male interns as a congressman. This is what E.J. wrote. Right out of the box, the widespread reaction to the Foley episode was that it would hurt the Republicans with their base of Christian and moral conservatives. Well, yes it will, he went on. But the implication here is that those of us who are not conservatives might somehow be less affected by what Foley did. Excuse me, but I am a married father of three, and that's more important to me than the fact that I am a liberal. Our kids matter infinitely more to me and my wife than the results of an election, even an election we both care a lot about. Like just about every parent I know, I was horrified by this episode because I couldn't believe that the politicians involved didn't themselves react first as parents, grandparents, aunts, or uncles, rather than as politicians. That is what I consider vintage E.J. Dion. He's been a frequent and outspoken critic of the Bush administration, but with a sense of what might be called optimism, or at least without cynicism, about the motives of the people involved. He administers what might be considered tough love, and while he hates the sin, he usually cuts more slack for the sinner. His perspective and intelligence have made him a regular on Meet the Press, National Public Radio, and CNN. He's a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, and a professor in the Foundations of Democracy at Georgetown University's Public Policy Institute. His book, Why Americans Hate Politics, was winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and his most recent book is Stand Up, Fight Back, Republican Toughs, Democratic Wimps, and the Politics of Revenge. His lecture tonight is entitled The Making of Democracy 2006, How the New Media and the Old Media could live together happily and enhance public life. As I said, E.J. is an optimist. It is my honor to present this year's Theodore H. White lecturer, E.J. Dion, Jr. I'm going to prove I'm Catholic. I feel very guilty after that introduction. I'll never live up to that, to that introduction. Um, I always tell my wife that uh, I know my first two kids, our first two kids are mine because they both arrived 10 days late. Uh, and so I want to apologize for being late. We were supposed to be in Boston at 3 and we ended up in Manchester at 6. And I just want to salute my friend, someone I so admire, uh, Molly Ivins, uh, for uh, keeping you here. The definition of life being unfair is actually having to speak after uh, Molly Ivins. She is not only one of the world's most committed people, but also one of the funniest. I can't remember if it was you, Molly, or Ann Richards joke, uh, the gas has gotten so expensive that women are now carpooling when they run over their husbands. Um, but I, she may have stolen it from you. Um, and uh, it's, it's, and, and the one thing that my, I will not repeat to my son, who, bless him, has followed me as a Red Sox fan, uh, is that you compare me to Johnny Damon. My son, 
actually has on his door a picture of Johnny Damon with the words traitor written uh, across it. So, but I very much appreciated what you were trying uh, to say with that one. Uh, Alex, and, and it was sure a lot more generous. I've been talking a lot about the election the last couple of weeks. Uh, I always was optimistic about the judgment of the American voter. Uh, and it was much kinder than the one I received recently, which ended, and now for the latest dope from Washington, here's E.J. Dion. And so here I am. Um, what a joy uh, it is to be here. There are so many dear, dear friends here. Uh, if I listed them all, I'd leave someone out and we'd be even later than we already are. But I do want to thank a few people. I want to thank Walter Shorenstein, uh, whom I've been blessed for knowing now for many, many years, and who last night celebrated the anniversary of this great center. Uh, he did so much to create in honor of his dear, warm, uh, and talented daughter. Uh, Marvin Kalb, there's Marvin, uh, the first director put this institution on the map and did something far, far more difficult uh, than getting Democrats and Republicans to get along. He got journalists and academics uh, to get along. Uh, and you really don't know how hard that is. I could tell you some stories afterward. Um, and also he got them to uh, work together profitably. And he did so because both worlds respect and admire his journalism and his uh, scholarship. And Alex did one of the world's very hardest things. You want to take a job after someone has failed miserably because you can't help but look good. But Alex took over this place uh, for Marvin and he has done a magnificent job. Alex is brilliant and gifted, but more importantly, and you can tell by how generous that introduction was, he's a very, very good human being and I'm really honored to be with you, Alex. And I just must mention family, the first Teddy White's uh, family. It means so much to me that my friend David White uh, is uh, here. David has been a friend uh, since we were in college, and it's because of David that I actually had a chance to have dinner with Teddy White in their New York City home while White was finishing the making of the president 1972. Uh, for me, a kid from Fall River who had been a political junkie since about the age of eight, having dinner with Teddy White was like having dinner with Bill Russell or Carl Yastrzemski. Uh, and David and I also worked together as interns uh, in the Paris Bureau of the New York Times in the summer of 1974. And if you want to roll on the floor laughing uh, tonight, ask David later about the very hardest task of his journalistic career having to transcribe an interview that the Flora Lewis, the distinguished journalist who had hired us both, did with French President Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, who insisted that the interview be done in English, a language he kind of, sort of, spoke. Uh, now, I admire anyone who speaks in a second or third language, uh, but imagine deciphering what the president meant when the tape recorder had him saying, I still remember David explaining this, the phrase was, constant moving change. Uh, that was constant moving change. We figured it out after several uh, listens. Uh, list David recovered from that to become a gifted writer of both uh, fiction and nonfiction, and he is a very dear person. David, thank you so much. Uh, for being here. Uh, finally, I want to send my love to my sister Lucy Ann Dion Thomas and her husband Drew Thomas and to Bert Yaffe. Uh, Lou and Drew are both lawyers who have served their country uh, for a quarter century, over a quarter century in the Navy, first on active duty and now as captains in the Navy Reserves. I always have to salute them. Uh, Lou, bless you uh, for being the warm and responsible older sister to a spoiled younger brother. God bless. Thanks. And Bert is my informal father. There you are, Bert. Um, you know, I always tell my kids that I was very blessed in life because I not only had great parents, but was also blessed that when my dad died, when I was a teenager, I found a great second father in Bert, uh, who has been in public service since he was a tank commander in Guam, Bougainville, and Iwo Jima, uh, and became, as I wrote in every press release on any subject, for his valiant 1970 anti-war campaign for Congress here in Massachusetts, a decorated Marine combat veteran. I love you, Bert, thank you. Um, I appreciate that Jean Shaheen, is Jean still here or did she have to go? Uh, but because uh, uh, is here tonight, there's a story about a paper uh, in New Hampshire, so proud to be first with the news that it boasted one day, we were the first paper in New Hampshire to report the news that Governor Shaheen was about to resign, Later, we were the first newspaper to report that this report was utterly without foundation. Um, uh, now, that story would not survive fact-checking, but it is a nice parable 
on the wonders of journalism, but we can be grateful uh, that we can tell jokes about our politicians and our media. Uh, the dictator of uh, the old East Germany, Walter Ulbricht, was said to have asked Chancellor Willy Brandt of West Germany if he had any hobbies. Uh, Brandt replied, yes, I collect the jokes that people tell about me, and what about you? And well, replied Ulbricht, I collect the people who tell jokes about me. Um, and if you don't believe that, there was a man in East Germany who discovered that his parrot had floated out, uh, flown out the window, and he rushed immediately over to the offices of the secret police to say, I want you to know that I absolutely do not share any of my parrot's political opinions. What a privilege it is to give this lecture in honor of Teddy White, one of the most creative and thoughtful political journalists in our nation's history. A white is often criticized for having a romantic view of politicians, uh, but he was actually realistic when it came to the general run of the breed. By and large, he wrote, more were grubby, short-sighted, or cause-gripped people as they entered politics, cutting deals and paying with favors and honors for the money that financed them. Uh, he wrote in America in search of itself in 1982. But for White, that was not the end of the story. A handful grew by experience, he wrote, to become larger people than when they entered. Only the tiniest few survived the process to become men of state worth remembering. It was this sifting process that fascinated me then and fascinates me even more now. Now that very phrase, men of state, sounds almost antique today. But the idea that some men and women engaged in public service are worth remembering uh, is still the right idea, even if it goes against the grain. Yet White carries a larger uh, burden than the accusation that he was a sucker for politicians. Uh, he has been repeatedly blamed for a style of reporting that has supposedly sent political journalism off the rails. Wife was for, uh, White was formally given credit for transforming American political journalism in Tim Krause's wonderful book, The Boys on the Bus, an account of the press's role uh, in the 1972 election. Uh, after White's first election volume, uh, The Making of the President, 1960, Krause argued, political reporting would never again be the same. White got into the back rooms of politics. He described their workings in fascinating detail. He made clear that while there was a hidden campaign, its secrets could be discovered by a normal, if gifted, journalist willing to ask the right people of the right, uh, the right questions and go to the right places at the right time. Uh, after White, it was impossible to ignore the snows of New Hampshire, which is why, by the way, I knew exactly where to go when I landed in Manchester uh, a little while ago. Uh, and the even earlier phases of electioneering that had before him received modest attention. It was even more dangerous for reporters to ignore the genius of particular political aides. White, for example, helped make famous the brilliant conservative operative and Barry Goldwater strategist F. Clifton White. In book after book, White described the shrewdness of certain strategists and the foolishness of others, and no self-respecting journalist would ever miss those stories again. Al Hunt, one of my favorite journalists, admired uh, White, uh, but he did capture very well how many journalists had applied White's legacy. The press gets so caught up in trying to report the story behind the scenes, Hunt wrote after the 1984 election, that major speeches or position papers of the substance of the campaign receive relatively little attention. Whole books and good ones have been written in reaction to White. After the 1980 election, Jeff Greenfield wrote The Real Campaign, How the Media Missed the Story of the 1980 Campaign. His point was straightforward, quote, that the flow of ideas and the underlying political terrain had more to do with the results than all the inside moves of all the inside strategists. Working on the same premise, the conservative writer Richard Brookheiser wrote a book on the 1984 election called The Outside Story. The title itself, A Conscious Rebellion Against the Growing Journalistic Tendency to Tell Teddy White Style the Inside Story. Brookheiser's perfectly sensible idea was that if you wanted to understand what happened in 1984, uh, you needed to look at what Ronald Reagan said and did and at what Walter Mondale said and did in, of all places, public. Now, the doubts about uh, White's legacy are an enduring refrain 
in post-election discussions of the press and politics, including at in distinguished institutions such as this one. To pick just one example, John Buckley, the communications director of Bob Dole's 96 campaign, told Ken Oletta that he ascribed journalist fascination with polling campaign personnel and political process to the making of the president, 1960. Now, if White is really responsible for encouraging us to forget the importance of idea, to, to ignore what candidates say in public, and to disregard the central vote role that voters and their moods and convictions play in deciding elections, he would indeed deserve all the criticism he gets and much more. But that is an enti entirely a caricature of Teddy White and what he did. Yes, he did get us into those back rooms. He did help us understand better how campaigns work and to see that it was not all magic and what, pray, is wrong with that. But much of White did was to attend to what politicians said and to set their campaigns in historical context. Paying attention to these parts of White's achievement is precisely what political journalism ought to do. One thing White knew for certain was that politics was much more than a backroom game and politicians much more than backroom dealers. Thus, no one paid more attention to the words spoken in public by politicians than White did. His books are full of very lengthy quotations from campaign addresses. You will find few nine-word ink bites in his books. Uh, more than that, White took the word seriously to, enough to ask all the time, what do these words mean? What is this politician trying to tell us? What are the implications of these words for our country? White did something else with campaigns. He treated them as an occasion for describing the state of the nation. He assumed correctly that election years are occasions when the country takes stock of itself and Americans try to figure out who we are and where we are going. White demonstrated that journalists are foolish if they don't use campaign time as an occasion to ask bigger than usual questions and paint larger than usual portraits of our nation. White's book on the 1960 campaign used that year's US Census to describe the momentous changes in the country since the war, when America was transformed from a nation defined by its cities into a nation defined by its suburbs. His 1964 book took the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King Jr. as central participants in that year's political fights. White devoted many of his brilliant pages to trying to understand not just how civil rights worked as a campaign issue, but why the civil rights struggle had changed the country and its people. So if you take Teddy White seriously, it's easy to have arguments with him about his political views, about his judgments. Uh, it would be hard to find anyone who agreed with White on everything because his convictions were so particular, so rooted in his own reporting, and so rooted in his own personal story. But the simple fact is, that if reporters today learn all the lessons White tried to teach about the potential richness of political writing, American journalism would get a whole lot better. Now because I hold this view, this exalted view of Teddy White, because I believe he was so gifted at spotting and describing large turns in American public life, I began thinking about what White would make of the new back rooms in American politics, the offices and kitchen tables of those Andrew Sullivan described as the pajama hadin, the bloggers, and the other technological developments uh, that have uh, challenged journalism and the old ways of doing politics. What would he make of the fact that the two most powerful outside influences on my son James's politics, I say outside only because I pray we parents still have some modest influence, the two greatest influences are John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. And I confess I don't mind that a bit. Um, what would White make of the conflicts between the so-called old media or the so-called mainstream media and the new media? Uh, there is some hostility between these two breeds of communication, and tonight, in the spirit of bipartisanship that everyone is now talking about in Washington after the last election, I want to suggest that the two forms can complement each other and indeed have already begun to do so. If I may summarize what I have to say, it's that I believe it is absolutely essential to preserve the financial base that supports independent journalism, that pays for good old-fashioned reporting and investigation that citizens, whatever their political views, can rely on. We need to support the courageous work of reporters in Iraq and Afghanistan and in so many other places where journalists take great risks 
to keep free citizens informed. Careful, accurate reporting takes a lot of time and a lot of money, and we dare not lose this great work supported by great media institutions. But one can assert this and still welcome the work of the new media, of the opinionated bloggers and activists, and even the talk radio and television shouters, some of whom I often disagree with rather emphatically. Uh, in my view, the new media forms are answering a great need that traditional journalism was not answering. Um, though as a, uh, as a consumer of blogs from left to right, I often get important and accurate information from them, they do not exist primarily to inform. They exist to engage citizens in the obligations and magic of politics. They draw people into the fight. They have made millions of people feel that their voices will be heard somewhere and when aggregated together can have a real influence on the outcome of policy debates and elections. In fact, the opinionated forms of journalism are not new to the media or our public life. They take us back in our history to a time when most journalism was partisan and raucously engaged on one side or another in our political battles, sometimes even corruptly engaged. Uh, the current structure of the media is the product of the last great overturning of political institutions during the progressive era. We are now in the middle, I think, of a new revolt against the journalistic order. To understand how we got here, it's worth examining the last great revolt at the turn of the century. From the beginning of our republic in the 1790s until the turn of the century, American newspapers were, for the most part, organs of political parties. There was no ideal of objectivity. On the contrary, the purpose of newspapers was to mobilize support for parties all year round. But during the Gilded Age, as the historian Christopher Lash pointed out, parties got a bad name. Reformers who looked for professionalism as against bossism in politics eventually turned to seeking professionalism in journalism. Walter Lippmann, one of the most influential journalists in American history, after Teddy White, of course, led the way to a redefinition of journalism's roles, role and the journalist's responsibilities. The notion that newspapers should be objective rather than partisan was the product of Lippmann's admiration for the scientific method. Uh, his skepticism of ideology and some of his critics would argue his less than full-hearted support for faith in democracy. Uh, could democracy survive, Lippmann asked, when the manufacture of consent is an unregulated private enterprise? He argued that the quack, the charlatan, the jingo, and the terrorist can flourish only when the audience is deprived of independent access to information. Lippmann scolded journalism this way. The cynicism of the trade needs to be abandoned, for the true patterns of the a journalistic apprentice are not the slick persons who scoop the news, but the patient and fearless men of science who have labored to see what the world really is. It does not matter that the news is not subject, uh, susceptible of mathematical statement. In fact, just because the news is complex and slippery, good reporting requires the exercise of the highest of the scientific virtues. Now, who knew that we journalists, we ink-stained wretches, were actually like physicists, biologists, and chemists? Um, but more was going on in journalism than a shift in philosophy. As Paul Weaver pointed it out in his provocative book, uh, News and the Culture of Lying, Joseph Pulitzer, the great American press lord after whom our most uh, prestigious journalistic prizes are named, revolutionized journalism by fully understanding its commercial potential. He not only helped move journalism away from political parties, but more generally away from public affairs as defined by the major institutions of his day. As Weaver wrote, Pulitzer was taking events out of their official context and framing them in stories with sharp, dramatic focus that suggested intense public interest. He achieved this effect by incorporating into journalism the elements of drama, character, action, and plot. Now that sounds pretty good, but Weaver argues that Pulitzerian journalism moved the craft away from politics in the process. Again, Weaver, it addressed not the citizen and the constitutionalist and the partisan, but the private pre-political human being, where the old journalism had invited its readers to step into and renew their commitment to constitutional and political processes, the new Pulitzerian journalism was inviting people to turn away from formal institutions and focus instead on the community evoked by the storytellers of the newsroom. One of the main effects of this change, Weaver concluded, was to transform newspapers from a reader-focused, reader-driven business into an advertiser-focused, advertiser, 
uh, driven business. As Michael Chudson notes in his excellent history of American newspapers, most leading newspaper proprietors of the late 19th century were businessmen rather than political thinkers, managers more than essayists or activists. By being nonpartisan and objective, newspapers did not offend half or more of their potential readers. Historian Michael McGurr cites Whitlaw Reed's loving description of independent journalism as passionless ether, which inadvertently also suggested the problems caused by the decline of the partisan press. It was not much noted at the time that a decline in the press's partisan passions might also have a negative effect on democratic politics. And now, however objectivity might have been as a philosophical principle, it did not come under sharp practical challenge until the 1960s. Journalism was no less susceptible than other institutions to the dissenting currents of that time. The critique of allegedly apolitical journalism that arose then is summarized nicely by Chudson. Journalists in this view were inevitably political, even if unwittingly uh, or unwillingly. Uh, he goes on that their political impact lay not in what they openly advocated, but in the unexamined assumptions on which they based their professional practice, and most of all, in their conformity to the conventions of objective reporting. In this view, objectivity was not an ideal, but a mystification. The slant of news lay not in explicit bias, but in the social structure of news gathering, which reinforced official viewpoints. Now, if there was a critique of the establishment media from the left, there was also a critique of the liberal media uh, from the right. Note that the left saw it as the establishment media and the right saw it as the liberal media. Uh, it began to take hold after Barry Goldwater's 1964 campaign. Conservatives have been enormously successful in getting editors and producers to look over their right shoulders. And it really was not until the last five years or so that liberals and the left managed a genuinely effective counterattack largely through the new media. Now consider again that phrase, passionless ether. If there is a problem with traditional just the facts ma'am journalism and it's twist yourself into a pretzel effort to appear nonpartisan or bipartisan, it is that such journalism was in many ways demobilizing because journalists could not declare that they were Republicans or Democrats, liberals or conservatives. They often went out of their way, sometimes unconsciously and unintentionally, to, to uh, put forward a variety idea of ideas that may have driven people away from politics. You couldn't be partisan, so you said they were all crooks and liars. Or you couldn't be partisan, so every once in a while you could say, well, they're all good men and women. You couldn't be partisan, so you said there was no difference between or among the politicians, or alternatively, that they were all too extreme. But pure nonpartisanship, uh, in the sense of bending over too far to seem to be fair, uh, can mislead reporters. Let me offer a couple of extreme, very extreme cases. I hope no reporter ever wrote the sentence, a spokesman for Mr. Hitler denied that he was an anti-Semite. I hope no one ever wrote that. Or uh, an aide to Mr. Stalin, who asked not to be named, said the Soviet leader in fact opposed building the gulag. Uh, it's more important, I think, to care about what's true than to worry if someone else is going to see you uh, as too partisan. Nancy Pelosi once said that she was always amazed uh, that the same voters could say that they didn't like politicians because they always fought with each other and because there was no difference among them. Of course, maybe they were fighting all the time about things that didn't matter to that particular voter. My hunch is that this voter and millions like her were looking for something that neither journalism nor politics promotes enough genuine argument. But what is genuine argument? In real argument, as the late historian Christopher Lash nicely put it, we have to enter imaginatively into our opponent's arguments if only for the purpose of refuting them. And we may end up being persuaded by those we sought to persuade. Argument is risky and unpredictable and therefore educational. Arguments are not won, Lash noted, by shouting down opponents. Rather, they are won by changing opponents' minds, something that can only happen if we give opposing arguments a respectful hearing and still persuade their advocates that there is something wrong with those arguments. Uh, Lash referred back to the debates during the 1920s between Lippmann 
and the philosopher John Dewey. Dewey insisted against Lippmann's skepticism that democracy was a practical as well as a noble system of government. Dewey did so in part because he had an enormous faith in the educational functions of free and open debate in a democracy. Where Lippmann believed that facts and information were more important than argument, Dewey believed, as Lash put it, that our search for reliable information is itself guided by the questions that arise during arguments about a given course of action. The real issue confronting journalism in our time, I believe, is thus a paradoxical one. There is, on the one hand, a need to resurrect a concern for what's true, to draw clearer distinctions between fact and opinion, between information and mere assertion. At the same time, there is an urgent requirement that the media take seriously their, our obligation to draw people as citizens into the public debate, to demonstrate that the debate is accessible, that it matters. What's needed, in other words, is a strengthening of both the older professional ethic involving accuracy and balance and a new engagement with the obligations of journalism to democracy. For all its shortcomings, the, successes, the success of opinionated journalism on the radio and cable television and the blogs reflects a public thirst for debate and argument that goes beyond the confines usually imposed by conventional definitions of news. The lesson is not that all should copy their style of argument, God forbid, but that argument and engagement are very much in demand. For the established media, this will mean going back to the original debate between Walter Lippmann and John Dewey. The objective should be to salvage Lippmann's devotion to accuracy and fairness by putting these virtues to the service of the democratic debate that Dewey so valued. In broad terms, the, the media need to help us recover, uh, as Lash put it, the lost art of argument. I believe that if the old media do their jobs, our jobs properly, and the new media do theirs right, we will be able to draw on the best aspects of both Lippmann and Dewey to find the right balance between the thirst for accurate information and the hunger for engagement, between a journalism that tells hard truths even if partisans don't like them, and a partisan media that sometimes tells hard truths about the mainstream media. Yes, we too can get things wrong. And that assimilates real information into their passionate forms of advocacy. Now let me be clear, in arguing that the new partisan media, from Captain's Quarters and Powerline to Bull Moose Blog and Daily Coast and Huffington Post and Talking Points Memo, among many others, in arguing that they are playing an important democratic role, I am emphatically not saying that they are any substitute for the old media. On the contrary, the old media are more important than ever in this happy, if sometimes angry, partisan and ideological cacophony. I think the New York Times' brilliant literary critic Michiko Kakutani got it absolutely right 12 years ago when she wrote that throughout our culture, the old notions of truth and knowledge are in danger of being replaced by the new ones of opinion, perception, and credibility. She argued that as reality comes to seem increasingly artificial, complex, and manipulable, people tend to grow increasingly cynical, increasingly convinced of the authenticity of their own emotions, and increasingly inclined to trust their ideological reflexes. In such a situation, there are no real arguments in the sense of an engagement over ideas and evidence, but simply a clash of assertions. Uh, in this climate, said Kakutani, the democratic ideal of consensus is futile. We are witness, she wrote, to the creation of a universe in which truths are replaced by opinions. Now, Kakutani points to a crucial aspect of the media problem. Many of the partisan arguments we hear on television and radio amount to set-piece blather. People play roles instead of offering real argument. They can be indifferent to facts. They can engage in cheap ridicule, empty bloviation. One of the reasons Stewart and Colbert are so popular is that they so brilliantly poke fun at the junk that so often passes as serious political discourse. Um, and Molly Ivins does a pretty mean job of that too. Um, and yes, there is a problem when an increasingly balkanized information world in which partisans get more and more information from sources that reinforce uh, rather than challenge their own commitments. It's also important that, that many of the new media are largely parasitic on the news gathering of the older media. I use parasitic here in a descriptive, not judgmental sense. With rare exceptions, and they do exist, the new media do not finance news gathering or reporting. 
they largely rely on the older institutions to support the reporting. They either use this work themselves, or they criticize it, or they do both. At the same time, though, the new media challenge the financial base of the old news organizations. The older media themselves have been forced to challenge their own financial base. They have set up internet operations which have yet to create revenue streams comparable to what those organizations earn from their older products such as newspapers and network broadcasts. Yet these competing outlets within the same organizations can undercut the readership and viewership of their flagship enterprises. So yes, I do think we need to pray for the old media. We need to pray that the old media find ways of navigating the difficult financial waters in which they now find themselves. But we should also welcome raucous argument of the, uh, the raucous argument of the new media because it is one of the gifts of a democratic republic to have raucous arguments. Uh, Christopher Lash again put it well. If we insist on argument as the essence of education, we will defend democracy not as the most efficient, but as the most educational form of government, one that extends the circle of debate as widely as possible and thus forces all citizens to articulate their views, to put their views at risk, and to cultivate the virtues of eloquence, clarity of thought and expression, and sound judgment. If the media fail to nurture uh, that educational spirit that ought to lie at the heart of democracy, what exactly is the point of what we journalists do? Journalism is in fact more dependent upon the democratic idea than almost any other trade or profession or business because we journalists actually believe that people care enough about their society, their nation, their world to take the time to understand what is going on around them. Uh, by what we do, we reject the idea that knowledge and the right to make decisions on that knowledge ought to be confined to an elite. It was once said that status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. Um, <clears throat> I think the media are in a bit of a mess in significant part because our democratic systems are in a bit of a mess. But I prefer to end on a hopeful note. Let those of us in traditional journalism not shrink from the challenges of the new technologies, of the blogs, and of the new opinionated journalism. Let us welcome those challenges and their potential contributions. Uh, if a dry or detached or apolitical press threatened to demobilize citizens, the world of opinionated journalism might offer new opportunities to encourage uh, citizens to engagement, to action, and yes, to good citizenship. The blogs in particular have developed an audience because there is a demand, as John Dewey would understand, for a medium that prizes commitment and engagement. That there is such a thirst for this may bother those who worry about excessive partisanship, but engagement is indispensable in democratic politics. And the, profession, and the proliferation of new outlets, the rebirth of what my friend Tom Rosenstiel has called the pamphleteering tradition, could democratize both politics and the media. But yes, there is also an obligation not to confuse partisan media with independent media. There is an enormous need for information.